All right. I want to mention meteors here. I think we have a little bit of time because they're connected to comets. So I know you haven't done this part of the reading before. So I'll just see what you might have learned from wherever you learn things, school out there in the world. You've probably heard of meteors, meteorites, and meteoroids before. So do you know the difference between those terms? Okay, I see most votes for one and two. So yes, the I-T-E um, suffix, meteorites, um, refers to the rock. So meteorites are the part that lands on the ground. It turns out that meteoroid, that is the original piece of rock from space. And then meteor is what it's called as it burns up in Earth's atmosphere. So where do meteoroids come from? Well, they can come from either asteroids or comets. And so for that reason, meteoroids can have the compositions of asteroids or they can have the compositions of comets. So this is how meteors are related to comets. Um, comets leave behind these giant coma um, from their dust tail, right? They, they leave behind globs and globs of particles as they pass through the inner solar system. And occasionally the earth passes through that debris trail and that is what results in some of our repeating meteor showers. So you might've heard of the Perseids that happen in August, the Leonids happen in November. The reason that these happen at very specific times of year is because the earth passes through that debris cloud at the same time each year. Um, if you've ever watched a meteor shower, then you probably know that they can be seen all across the sky, but often you hear them referred to as being in some constellation. So like the Perseids come from the apparent location of Perseus, the constellation. Um, that refers to what we call the meteor's radiant. That is where all of the different streaks in the sky appear to originate. And it's kind of like train tracks. You can imagine all of the different paths that you see lead back to the same distant point. And that's just the direction that Earth is um, intersecting that debris cloud in its orbit. Um, the same effect happens for other planets too. It's just that we're not there to observe it. So Mercury passes through the debris cloud of Comet Anki. And so it has meteor showers too. The only problem with Mercury though is it has a really thin atmosphere. So it probably wouldn't be that impressive to watch. They would mostly just hit the surface as meteorites. Um, sometimes really big meteors hit, um, burn up in the atmosphere. Most meteoroids are pea-sized objects, and so they just result in those brief streaks of light that you see as meteors, but larger pieces like golf ball-sized ones can produce what we call fireballs. Um, this one was from, what year was this? 2013 in Chelyabinsk, Russia. Um, this one created a big boom, and this was captured by some driver's dashboard camera. So that's pretty fun to watch if you can find the video. There are also um, meteorites that we've collected that hit the ground. And generally, a meteoroid would have to be as big as a bowling ball to produce an object that makes it all the way to the ground instead of burning up in the atmosphere. We track the number of asteroids. So we basically know which ones could become um, meteorites eventually. But even though we know most of the large near-Earth asteroids based on the counts, not increasing anymore as you continue counting, we only know of about 10% of small asteroids and you know, know their positions and orbits extremely well. So that means there's a whole bunch of small asteroids that surprise us like this. Um, like I mentioned before, since meteorites have different compositions based on their parent body, the meteoroid, they have different compositions when they reach the ground too. So the stones, irons, and stony irons come from different kinds of asteroids, different asteroid classes. Some of these meteorites are extremely large. So this is a picture of the Willamette meteorite that was actually found in the Willamette Valley. The um, 
native people here used to use it for ceremonies, but then um, in the 1800s, some pioneer basically stole it from the valley and sold it to the Smithsonian Museum. It's still there and they um, give now the tribe access for special ceremonies to it, um, but there's a push to get the Willamette meteorite back in native hands. All right. When we can pick up meteorites that strike the surface of the earth, it's helpful because then we can do radioactive dating on them. And when we do that, we find that most meteorites are four and a half billion years old. So in the chat, what's the significance of that number? Four and a half billion. You can just send, you don't have to wait. All right, yeah, four and a half billion years old is how old the solar system is. And so if a meteorite is that old, we call it primitive. So why do you suppose it's really interesting to get our hands on primitive meteorites from objects that have never been differentiated? I'll give you about a minute to type your ideas into the chat here. Yeah, exactly. So um, the Murchison meteorite here is an example of a primitive meteorite. It's not composed entirely of the same material. Um, it's composed of small bits of whatever had condensed out of the solar nebula at that point. So as you can see here, there's inclusions of different colors indicating that it must be um, different composition. But because it's not differentiated, it hasn't changed at all since the beginning of the solar system. So this gives us an idea of what that earliest raw material in the solar system was like. And yes, indeed, it could tell us the composition of the solar nebula in a way that is hard to deduce based on looking at everything else. Yeah, it's older, it's older than the planets, basically. So it's cool to look at because you can tell exactly what was in the solar nebula at that point. 